guys and welcome. Welcome to the Help Your Clients Build Their Booster Plan webinar. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Rebecca Rushton. I've been a podiatrist for 25 years. I'm a Curtin graduate and I have a special interest in foot blisters. I've been living and working in Esperance WA for the past 18 years. Uh, it's a wonderful place to be. It's a largely retirement town for the surrounding mining and farming areas and we get lots of holidays and grey nomads passing through. And our population is about 15,000. So I'm the only podiatrist here. So really I'm a generalist kind of podiatrist. So with all that considered, you may be wondering why I've developed a special interest in foot blisters. Well, the answer is because I've got blister prone feet. I get foot blisters way too easily, particularly since about the age of 25. So that's about 20 years now if you do the math. I mean, I always seem to get blisters at the back of my heels fairly easily, especially with new shoes, but this exacerbation coincided with me getting into more regular exercise. Nothing too strenuous, mind you, just walking my dog every morning, playing hockey twice a week and a bit of running. And I tried everything, everything I knew of to stop blisters, taping, orthotics, socks, the best shoes, lubricant, and I still got blisters. So here I was, a podiatrist who couldn't fix her own foot problem. Talk about frustrating. And it wasn't, you know, some rare, glamorous or difficult foot problem. It was just plain old common as muck friction blisters. Well, actually, I'm not sure if you know, but foot blisters are the most common injury in sport. Granted, they don't get the attention of musculoskeletal injuries, but they're not an insignificant injury in terms of pain or limited performance. I usually hear from athletes in the lead up to an event and in the latter stages of their training, They've got a blister or two or three and they don't know what to do about it. They're torn between continuing with their training plan, which they want to do more than anything else, so they're in top physical condition for race day, and resting up to give their blister time to resolve so it doesn't impede them on the big day. But even if they do decide to treat it, they're never quite sure if they're doing the right thing. They're never quite sure if they're going to make it better or worse because when it boils down to it, they really have no idea why they got this blister. Now, I don't know about you, but I used to be rather inept at helping my clients with foot blisters. All I had was, make sure your shoes fit well. Hmm, they look okay, but maybe get a new pair and see if that helps. Make sure you're taping the area. Here, let me show you how to do that. And I'd address any mechanical issues, whether they were likely to be relevant to that blister location or not, and really just hope for the best. If that didn't work, all I had left was to tell them about body glide and really I'd cross my fingers and hope I didn't see them again because I was out of ideas after that. And this was at the very time when these exact strategies were not helping me and my blisters. That is, my perfectly fitting athletic shoes, every orthotic prescription I attempted and tweaked within an inch of its life, my good sports socks, daily taping with fixamol, leucoplast and combinations of the two, and occasional lubricant. Like, I'm sure you can see the irony here. I love being a podiatrist. I enjoy going to work every day and helping people with their feet. And I consider myself to be at least half decent at my job, even back then. So if a half decent podiatrist with a good education and a good amount of get up and go couldn't fix what, let's face it, is a pretty common foot problem, there's something wrong here. It can't just be me. So a bit over 10 years ago, I decided I had to knuckle down and figure this thing out. Long story short, I did figure it out and I realized I can't afford to keep this stuff to myself. So I made a website to document everything I learned and now I help people all over the world with their blisters from my website and my courses. Active people, not so active people, from weekend warriors to elite athletes in all sorts of sports from running to hiking, tennis and netball are big ones, the armed forces and miners and just people in general going about their daily activities who are troubled by blisters. The other thing I do, and one of my most important aims, is to help my profession get better at helping people with their foot blisters. Because I remember when my own ability to be of any real help to my clients for this common foot problem was far from adequate, and it wasn't a good feeling. And because, well, it's our job. If anyone needs to be good at fixing foot blisters, it's a podiatrist. So I'm hoping I can share some stuff with you today that might help you in some way in your clinics as of tomorrow. I do apologise for my croaky voice, I'm on the tail end of a cold. In the next half hour or so, I'm going to show you two things. I'm going to show you what causes blisters, 
and I'm going to show you how prevention strategies work. Because if you can get your head around these two things, you'll be able to provide the best advice and treatment to your clients and have a massive impact. Now here's the most important thing you need to know, and it's at the root of why people are mystified about blisters. It's what actually causes blisters. If there's one thing I want you to remember from today, it's this. It's what causes blisters, because the mainstream understanding of what causes blisters is slightly off, and this is the reason why blisters remain one of the most common injuries in sport. What do I mean by slightly off? Well, tell me what you think causes blisters. Chances are you might say something along the lines of heat, moisture and friction, or poorly fitting shoes, or something like that. Well, firstly, there's more to it than bad shoes. You can have perfectly fitting shoes and still get blisters, just like I used to. Secondly, blisters aren't caused by heat. They're not a burn or moisture. You don't have to get blisters just because your feet sweat a lot. Are they caused by friction? Well, kind of. The problem is when you say friction, you actually mean rubbing and blisters are not caused by rubbing. Let me explain, do this with me. Place the tip of your right index finger on the back of your left hand. Now wobble it back and forth, but keep it stuck to the same bit of skin. Notice how your skin stretches. This is what causes blisters, the skin stretching too much. This stretching is called skin shear. Now keep wobbling while you think about this. Skin shear might look like rubbing, but it's not. Notice how your fingertip has not actually moved relative to the skin on the back of your hand because your fingers stuck to that same bit of skin, right? But your skin has moved relative to the underlying bone and everything in between is stretched. This is shear, a parallel sliding of tissue layers across one another. Shear happens internally, whereas if we were rubbing the back of your hand, rubbing happens on top to the surface of the skin. Yes, it involves shear too, but it's the internal stretching part that causes blisters, not the external rubbing part. When skin shear is excessive and repetitive, a tiny tear occurs just under the skin surface that within two hours fills with fluid to look like what we know and love as a blister. Does that make sense? Now think about it. Is it any wonder that if we've got the wrong end of the stick when it comes to what causes blisters, that we find it difficult to manage them? No, it's not surprising at all. I mean, we're focusing on the wrong thing. And I'm gonna show you the implications of this soon. So that's the first thing. Blisters are caused by skin shear. Now let's look at blister prevention because I think this is where we can have the most meaningful impact to our clients. You know, it's when you match the science of what causes blisters to the science of how blister prevention strategies works that everything just falls into place. So just give me a second to have a quick drink and we'll go through all of these prevention strategies. Okay, first off, toughening your skin. <clears throat> it's true that you can actually toughen your skin by changing its structure to make it more resistant to blister formation. Just like how you can change the structure of a tendon to make it more able to cope with the forces applied to it and therefore more resistant to injury. It's called adaption. If you subject your feet to the forces causing blisters, the skin changes in positive ways. It adapts. Specifically, cell turnover is faster, the skin becomes thicker, and the skin cells are more resistant to frictional forces. How do we achieve this? You guessed it. Gradually increase the time you spend in your shoes and socks and insoles and orthotics or any other foot gear. Gradually increase your distances. If you're carrying a backpack, make sure you let your feet get used to this extra weight, including what it might mean for alterations in your gait. And make these changes small and incremental to benefit from this gradually increasing skin resistance. There are two things I need you to know though. Adaption doesn't mean big chunky calluses. That's just taking it too far. Calluses don't in themselves protect against blisters. You can get blisters under calluses and they're not nice. Really, less is more and the changes in the epidermis aren't necessarily all that noticeable. The second thing is, adaption can only go so far. For many people, this strategy alone will keep them blister free, but for others, it will help, but only to a certain point. 
For me, my walking was daily and hockey twice a week and some activity specific running drills once a week. My skin did all the adapting it was capable of and it wasn't enough. But one thing's for sure, nobody can afford to neglect this blister prevention strategy. Now before I move away from this strategy, a lot of people think this skin toughening strategy is all about applying a drying astringent agent to the skin. The types of products mentioned are usually things like witch hazel, surgical spirit, coal black tea, soaks and the like. Now these may or may not provide structural toughening changes to the skin. It hasn't been established and I certainly can't tell you how long it lasts. But more than anything, they dry the skin out. And dry skin is good for blister prevention because dry skin exhibits a lower friction level. But that's not necessarily making it structurally tougher. Semantics, maybe, but it's this kind of lack of detail that has contributed to where we are with blisters today. So I like to get as specific as possible so I'm 100% on top of what I'm actually trying to achieve. Either way, the effect is probably very short term as when your foot is enclosed in a sock and a shoe and you're exercising, a dry environment quickly changes to a moist and tacky environment and that's a high friction environment. Shoes. Well, look, this barely needs explaining, but you've got to have shoes that are fit for purpose and that fit well in length and width. Depending on the activity, the shoes that fitted well at the start of the day may be too small on day two. Now I'm talking mainly of the ultra marathon events I've been to, but no doubt other endurance events too. So while you can take advantage of special lacing techniques to enable best possible fit, sometimes a different pair of shoes may be required. What I do want to say about shoe fit pertains to people that just can't get perfect shoe fit because their feet are an odd shape, like bunions or a tailor's bunion for example. Yes, you have to exhaust all options for width, but when you've exhausted all options and shoe fit is still not perfect, which is not that uncommon, doesn't mean you'll never be blister free. No, it doesn't. Here's what I mean. Let's break this down. So blisters are caused by skin shear, right? Every single one of them. And when you go to prevent blisters, you've got to use strategies that reduce skin shear. But what causes skin shear? I'll tell you three things, high pressure, high friction levels, and bone movement. Try that finger on the back of your hand trick again. This time press very lightly. There's not much skin stretching before your fingertip slides across the skin surface, is there? Now press as hard as you can. Notice how there's a lot of skin stretching before your finger slides across the skin surface. This is why high pressure areas are more susceptible to blisters. Now we're pretty good at reducing pressure already, but I'll go through some pressure man management strategies in a moment anyway. Now here's the other way we can reduce skin shear. Try that finger on the back of your hand trick again, but this time with some Vaseline or some other lubricant. Now understandably you might not have any handy, but do this sometime tomorrow and notice no matter how hard you press, your finger slides across the skin surface with very little stretching. That's because skin shear needs high friction levels to get anywhere near damaging proportions, even with the highest weight bearing pressure. This is a tricky strategy to get your head around and it can be a tricky strategy to get right. So I'm going to show you all the ways that you can achieve low in shoe friction levels for blisters in a minute. And lastly, you also need a moving bone. If we were pressing on the back of our hand really, really hard and friction levels were unbelievably high, there would still be no skin shear until a bone started to move. Think about blisters under the metatarsal heads for a minute. When your foot plants, the metatarsal head skid forward over the skin and then backwards during propulsion. High pressure and friction levels are keeping the skin surface, the sock and the shoe all stuck together in relatively stationary contact but the bones are moving back and forth relative to the skin surface. Imagine what's happening to everything in between the skin surface and the bone. It's being stretched because it's all connected. This shear is normal. It happens with every step that we take and our tissues are able to deal with a lot of it. But you can imagine that as your activity increases in intensity or duration, shear may reach a point where it becomes excessive and that is just too much for the skin to handle. At that point, the epidermis fatigues and a tear occurs under the skin surface and within two hours you'll have a blister. 
So every blister is caused by skin shear and skin shear is the result of high pressure, high friction levels and moving bones. So these are our opportunities for blister prevention. Does that make sense? If not, tell me where I'm losing you in the chat right now or at the end and I'll explain further. So when bony prominences like a bunion or a tailor's bunion means that we're getting more pressure than we'd like and we can't reduce that as much as we'd like, we still have other options to reduce skin shear. In the case of a bunion or a tailor's bunion, we need to double down on friction levels as a minimum and I can tell you when done right, this can stop blisters from forming. The other thing I want you to know before we move on to socks is perfectly fitting shoes alone does not guarantee no blisters. I had superbly fitting shoes and I still got blisters. But shoe fit is one of the most basic prevention strategies there is and you have to get this right or as close as possible to it to make things easy for yourself. Okay, so when it comes to choosing socks, it's all about fibers, the fibers used in their construction. As I'm sure you're aware, avoid cotton at all costs because it's hydrophilic and will hold moisture near your skin, increasing friction levels. High grade merino wool is fine and actually it offers the best thermal insulation if you're in a cold environment. And then there are the synthetic fibres, namely acrylic, polyester and polypropylene. These synthetic fibres are the hydrophobic ones or the most hydrophobic ones. They repel water. There are three sock options. We've got moisture wicking socks, double socks and toe socks. So let's start with moisture wicking socks. Moisture wicking socks are considered a standard prevention strategy by pretty much everyone. They use combinations of the hydrophobic synthetic fibers to facilitate the movement of moisture away from the skin and into the sock to hopefully evaporate through the shoe upper. Now a lot of people give moisture wicking socks a little too much credit thinking they physically keep moisture off the skin and hold it in the outer of the sock or repel it out of the sock entirely. In reality, moisture wicking simply means distributing moisture evenly throughout the sock and this gives a larger surface area for evaporation, which is good. But it has to be able to evaporate. Your mesh uppers in sports shoes will allow this quite well, whereas leather hiking boots obviously not so much. My take on moisture wicking socks is this. Make use of them. Along with your perfectly fitting shoes and the training you've done to increase your skin's resistance to blister causing shear, these socks are the next step for general blister protection. They keep friction levels a little lower and that's a good thing. But as I said, how well they perform is limited to the ability of moisture to evaporate through the upper. Double socks. The gist of double socks is that the two socks slide against one another because of a comparatively lower friction level. So they're a friction management strategy too, but in a different way to moisture wicking socks. Double socks introduce an additional interface and it's intended to be a lower friction interface than the other interfaces. An interface is just where two surfaces touch. So in the shoe you have a skin sock interface and a sock shoe interface. And now with double socks, we introduce a sock sock interface. So looking at double socks, there's three double sock options. You can wear two socks on each foot, but not just any old combination of socks. To work as intended, you need a thin inner sock, one that's close fitting and smooth, something like lycra or sheer stocking. And on top of that, a standard athletic sock. Make that a moisture wicking sock and you'll be managing friction in two ways, moisture control and by adding the additional friction interface. Then there are socks that you can buy that have two socks sewn together already. The most well-known examples are right socks. From what I've seen though, these use two layers of the same material, so not quite so good. And then there are armor skin socks. You've probably heard of them. They're a bit different again. The sock has been purposely made with a very high friction material to sit against the skin and the outside of the sock has a very low friction surface. With a standard athletic sock as the second sock, this combination all but guarantees lots of movement happening between the two sock layers. The limitation with double socks is they're an all over friction management strategy. And with friction being low everywhere, it's all a bit slippery slidey. 
you've got to realize that the foot needs traction in your shoe for the mechanical efficiencies of gait like during acceleration and deceleration and changing direction without it you'll lose propulsive energy your balance will be reduced you'll be more susceptible to ankle sprains on uneven surfaces and your toes will jam into your toe box so where does your foot get traction from it gets it from high friction levels that's why shoes and socks are made from relatively high friction materials like not super high but high enough to give the foot traction and that's fine for most people in most situations but it's not fine for people who have combinations of skin with a low resistance to shear distortion or better known as blister prone or people who are active for long periods of time or traversing difficult terrain or with bony anomalies meaning there's localized areas of high pressure or foot function that means the bones move a lot relative to the skin surface that kind of thing really the best way to manage friction is by dealing with it in the discrete locations where it's a problem so that we can maintain traction everywhere else and we'll get more into this in a moment the last of the double sock mechanisms is toe socks in Gingy is a well-known brand they're a double sock strategy for the interdigital space nowhere else just the interdigital space they work in a couple of ways first they cushion the interdigital space as in the sock provides padding between the toes where usually there's nothing and secondly they form this double sock layer and the idea again is that one sock layer can rub against the other if you've got blisters between the toes these can be an easy fix they're not always enough but they're worth a try as long as you've got enough width in the toe box to accommodate them right lubricants let's talk breezy lubricants first Vaseline body glide rung goo height goo trail toes utter balm blister bomber bag balm tri slide there's tons of them they all make things slippery which is the same as saying they reduce friction levels and this is a great thing for blisters so why am I always a little cautious about recommending lubricants as a blister prevention strategy well there are five reasons firstly I see people lather lube all over their feet rather than apply it to the discrete areas and as we know this lack of traction is not ideal secondly friction levels increase after about an hour and a half whether it's just the fact that it disperses or absorbs or dissolves I can't tell you and whether this friction increase is worse because of the remnants of the lubricant I just don't know the research hasn't been done but essentially after a while friction levels increase above baseline third they occlude the skin which means they trap water inside the skin which has a weakening effect to shear forces they attract sand and grit which will abrade the skin and finally they retard the adhesion of tapes and dressings this is a big downside when it comes to blister treatment where you need to put a dressing over your blister and it's a big downside also if you're relying on preventive taping more or less lubricants and adhesive products are mutually exclusive then there are the dry lubricants which is what powders are powders absorb a small amount of moisture which keeps the skin drier which means it keeps friction levels lower until they absorb their capacity of about 13 to 17 percent of water and turn into a pasty blob that can end up actually causing a blister I'm not a huge fan of powders mainly because they don't work well enough for long enough except for two Tom's blister shield powder this powder is a bit different in that it doesn't absorb water it's a powder made not from talc or cornstarch like most of them but of PTFE PTFE means polytetrafluoroethylene and it's a very very low friction material the downsides are because it's so effective at reducing friction levels if you just tip a whole bunch of it into your sock and shake it around it will make things too slippery all over and compromise the efficiencies of gait again plus it may retard adhesive products like tapes and dressings from sticking but of the powders that's definitely the best one next are the engo blister patches that you stick to your shoe or insole or orthotic they're made out of the same PTFE that two Tom's blister shield powder is made from so they're a friction management strategy too I love these because they don't cover the whole in shoe environment you just put them at the spot where you're trying to stop blisters that way they maintain traction by leaving friction high where we need it and reduce it only where we need to the downsides are they need a dry surface to stick to for a strong initial adhesion 
and if the shoe gets really waterlogged they may come unstuck. They do tolerate getting a bit wet, um, even waterlogged sometimes if they've stuck really well to start with, but of course the more waterlogged they get the more likely they are to come unstuck from the shoe. They last a long time, months and months, they just stay in your shoe or on your orthotic or on your insole. And discovering these patches back in about 2008 was kind of what triggered me into all of this work I've done with blisters. I needed to find out why they work so well for me and where they fitted into the blister management spectrum, like as in how they worked in comparison to other strategies. Now I need you to know that I import Engo blister patches into Australia from America where they're made and that means I have a bias towards them, whether that's intended or not. So I want you to consider this and come to your own conclusion by considering its mechanism of action plus its pros and cons, just like you would any other product. Now we get to the pressure management strategies and this one's cushioning. The main types of cushioning for blisters are cushioned insoles like Spenko or Poron and toe covers like foam or silicon gel toe devices. What I can tell you in regard to the former is that Spenko and Poron have been compared in research in regard to blister prevention and Spenko outperforms Poron. And when it comes to digital devices, the silicon gel materials will almost definitely outperform tube foam and the like, even though there hasn't been any research comparing the two. But I'll explain why this is a safe assumption in a minute. Here's something you might not know. Cushioning materials have an additional blister prevention effect in that they absorb shear. Their ability to do this is measured by its shear modulus. This is the amount of give in the material. Just like how we wobbled our finger back and forth and our skin stretched, if you did the same thing with a cushioning material like Poron or Spenko or the foam or the silicon, it will undergo shear too. So if there's a material in your shoe that undergoes this shear within its structure, it means the skin doesn't have to undergo as much of it itself, which is a good thing for blister prevention. For cushioning to be effective, its properties must be a good match to the job at hand. If it's too soft, the cushioning material will simply flatten and not reduce the peak pressure at all. And if shear modulus is excessively low, our braking and propulsive mechanisms will be compromised, which reduces the mechanical efficiencies of gait. So which cushioning materials would I choose? Well, it depends on where your blisters are. For blisters on the planter surface, I'd choose Spenko as an insole or orthotic cover. And for just about every toe blister, I'd choose the silicon gel toe sleeves. Why not silicon as an insole or orthotic cover? Well, it's because it undergoes too much shear. It's like having a lubricant all over your feet. There's just no traction for the mechanical efficiencies of gait. But up at the lesser toes, traction is less important. And personally, even though I don't get toe blisters very often, I just would not leave home without a couple of these silicon gel toe caps or sleeves just in case. They're awesome. They're not without their downsides, but very good things to have up your sleeve. Let's get on to biomechanics now. I always tell people if they feel like they're not getting anywhere with their blisters to consider seeing a professional who knows how feet work. Someone who can assess overall mechanics and foot function and identify where blister causing shear is coming from. Orthotics, heel lifts, stretches, joint mobs, altering running technique and even the heel pitch on your shoes. The trick is everyone is different so when I'm talking to people online it's very difficult for me to give specific advice. In fact it's just not proper. So I tell people to see a podiatrist so that they can look at your foot structure, your biomechanics, your blisters and determine what you need. When it comes to orthotics, they can be very helpful for some blister locations and pretty much useless for others. As you know, orthotics have the ability to change the timing and the magnitude of the forces that cause blisters. Think pressure, friction, bone movement. But not just any old orthotic will do. It has to be an orthotic that changes the right forces in the right way for that individual. It could be an off-the-shelf orthotic, it might have to be custom made, or it could even be an orthotic that they already have with a modification or two. I almost always consider orthotics for people who are having trouble with blisters under the hallux, under the first or second MPJ, and under the arch. There's likely to be a hallux limitus, and they need examination to determine if it's functional or structural and what can be done about it. I almost never think about orthotics for heel blisters, 
but I often consider calf stretches and mobs, heel lifts, but really I can't go past the Engo blister patches for immediate relief for these blisters, especially when there's a really big Haglund's deformity and we're never going to get pressure down as much as we'd like. And for blisters under the ball of the foot, well, all of the above are really on my mind. It all depends on where the blister is and what's happening during function. We should also include the Otterform K toe props here and other similar devices. They can reduce skin shear for areas on the toes and keep them in mind. When the silicones are not ideal, try an Otterform K toe device. They can be great. And here's something I want to show you about toenail blisters under the big toenail when there's a functional hallux limitus. This is a modified cluffy wedge kind of a thing under the proximal phalanx. See how it changes the angle of the nail? So that's worth keeping in mind. And while we're here, this is a good time to talk about how although every blister is caused by skin shear, there are different reasons for that skin shear at different locations on your foot. So it's not a matter of throwing the same strategy at every blister. Like I used to go straight for taping for every blister location, no matter what. Even when I was getting blisters under my tape, I was still going for taping. You have to look at what's causing that shear. For this person, if they were getting blisters under their toenail or around the toenail, where's the shear coming from? More than likely, it's coming from the distal nail plate being pushed back by the shoe upper because of its angle and it'll be worse if we're running downhill or walking downhill. Think trail runners and hikers. Of course, you need to think about depth in the toe box, and I'd be making sure the laces are done up firmly to keep the toe out of the end of the toe box. Will moisture wicking socks help? Probably not, because friction and moisture aren't really implicated here. I'd be improving the function of the windless mechanism as one of my main strategies. Right, let's move on to the final blister prevention strategy, which is taping. One of my biggest mystery questions while I was researching blisters was how can you get blisters under tape? I mean, there's nothing rubbing the skin. Well, we know the answer to that now because blisters aren't caused by rubbing. But then knowing that, equally perplexing was why does it work sometimes? Well, here are the three reasons I've come up with. Number one, possibly by reducing friction. The smoother a tape is, the more it will reduce friction levels. Whereas a coarse textured kind of tape may even increase friction levels. So which tapes have a low friction level? I'm sorry to say I can't help you there. Frustratingly, none of the tapes used in blister prevention like Fixamol, Micropore, Leucoplast, Paper Tape, Rock Tape, Kinesiotex, none of them have had their friction properties tested in any research. Not even by their manufacturers, and I know because I've asked them. There is no coefficient of friction data for any of these sports tapes which is fair enough in itself because they aren't actually intended to be used for blister management, but still, you'd think they'd know. Secondly, potentially, a tape can reduce pressure. I mean, the thicker the tape, the more it will cushion your blister susceptible area, and again, that's good for blister prevention. The problem is, thicker tapes take up more room in your shoe and will be more likely to roll up at the edges, but nonetheless, that's a potential mechanism of action. And also, is it rigid or stretchy? The more rigid a tape is, the more able it is to spread shear load over a large area, thereby reducing shear load per unit area. And that's a good thing for blister prevention. This would mean something like rigid leucoplast would work better than fixamol because of its rigidity and thickness, actually. Not so good for toe blisters and other very contoured areas, but you can see where I'm coming from. So how do you think taping works? What types of tapes do you use for blister management? Is it smooth or textured? Is it thick or thin? Is it rigid or stretchy? Why don't you test it for yourself? Put some tape on the back of your hand and do the finger on the back of the hand trick again and see, does your skin shear more or less? Well, it does still shear quite a bit actually. Test all the tapes you've got and see which one works best. But when you see your skin stretching, remember, Sometimes people just need a little bit of shear reduction to keep them away from their blister forming threshold. Whereas others that are more blister prone, like me, we need a little more oomph out of our blister prevention strategy to remain blister free. And tapes possibly won't be enough. Whew. Okay, what have we learned so far? 
First, we've learned what really causes blisters. What's the answer? All together now, skin shear. And this requires a subtle mindset shift because we've all been working off an oversimplification of what causes blisters and we didn't even know it. So if there's one thing I hope you'll remember from this presentation tonight, it's that blisters are caused by skin shear. And if you want to have real confidence in successfully preventing blisters, you need to reduce skin shear, not rubbing. And you need to know how the various blister prevention strategies actually work at reducing skin shear to know how to pick the right one for your blister location. And second, we've learned how the different prevention strategies work. They all reduce skin shear by either pressure reduction, friction reduction, less bone movement, shear absorption, or spreading shear load. Most people gloss over this, and it's one of the reasons why people don't fully understand why what they're doing isn't working. Let's just take a quick 20 second break. Let some of that sink in, and I'll just grab a quick drink. And don't forget, if you've got any questions, just pop them in the question box or the chat box um, and I can answer them along the way or at the end of this session. Okay, for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to quickly gloss over blister treatment. Now I don't have time to cover every topic, but what I want to show you is how I approach the whole issue of foot blisters from go to woe. And I want to show you a quick video about Compede. Alright, this image pretty much defines the scope of the blister process. The first two stages are for blister prevention and the last three are blister treatment. Here's how I'd explain blister management and where the opportunities are for you or your client to have an impact. Ideally, you can help your client stay in the blister-free zone by implementing one or more of the strategies we've just covered tonight. It all depends on where their blister is and where that shear is coming from. You know, remaining blister-free is very possible no matter what their sport or foot structure or how blister-prone they are. You just have to find what's causing the skin shear and match that to the right blister prevention strategy. If they're not quite on top of things and during their training or on game day or race day or they're out on the track, they start to feel a hot spot developing, that's when we hit stage two and you're probably not around at this stage so your client needs to know exactly what to do and how to do it because there's no time to think about it. What most people don't understand about the hot spot stage is it's brief. It doesn't last an hour or half an hour and sometimes it doesn't even last five minutes. I tell people they have to act fast if they want to stop this blister. You don't have time to think about it because this blister is imminent. You need to get to it and implement whatever prevention strategy you have planned for this blister location straight away. Yep, ideally you would have had it in place before you started, but you know, there are lots of reasons why you might not have it already there. But if you don't have it there already, you need to have access to the gear you intend to use. That means you need to have your blister kit within easy reach or at least be carrying one or two choice pieces of kit that you can rely on. That's tricky in some athletic situations and it might not even be practical, which makes stage one all the more important and it's where you as a podiatrist can have the biggest positive impact. The hardest thing to do is to get people to stop and you can't make people stop, but just let them know that if they feel a bit of a sting, they're too late. That's the tear under the skin surface and within two hours they'll have a blister. <clears throat> if we don't manage to prevent the blister, we get into stages three, four and five and let's face it, unexpected things can happen and it's vital people know how to treat a foot blister properly to make it feel better, not worse. And each stage has a slightly different slant on the aim of treatment given. The aim of treating an intact blister is to protect his blister roof and I'm conveniently ignoring the fact that sometimes it's preferable to lance a blister, but that's a whole other conversation. The aim of treating a torn blister is to prevent infection, and the aim of treating a de-roof blister is to promote good skin healing. And a big part of this is choosing the right dressing, and a hydrocolloid like Compede is the best in most situations. Now I'm going to show you a video that a lot of people relate to in regard to choosing the right blister dressing and specifically Compede. 
If you can let your clients know this or get them to watch this video, you'll save them from falling into these traps. And it's the ones that have fallen for this in the past that will be the most grateful, just to understand what went wrong and why. Let's have a look now. It's about the three most common mistakes when using Compaid. Hi, Rebecca here from Blister Prevention. Have you ever used a hydrocolloid blister dressing? You know, those yellow gummy kind of blister dressings like Compaid. I bet you've made one of these three common mistakes. I see people make them all the time. So in this video, I'm going to show you what these three mistakes are so you can start using Compaid properly and so you can stop making your blisters worse. Now, when I say Compaid, I actually mean any hydrocolloid dressing. Compaid, Compheal, Duoderm, Band-Aid Advanced Healing, they're all hydrocolloids. They're kind of a yellow gummy material. They come in lots of shapes and sizes, and they're very adhesive. Now, I love hydrocolloids. They're brilliant at getting a certain kind of blister to heal faster. But for the rest, they're bad news. Now, that's not the dressing's fault. It's our fault for not using it properly. So let me show you what these mistakes are now, so you can avoid them as of today. Mistake number one is to expect Compede to prevent blisters. I'm sorry, but hydrocolloids just don't prevent blisters. The skin shear that causes blisters still happens in spite of having a dressing stuck to the skin. And it's just far too common that blisters develop underneath it. Let me show you an example. Now, if you don't like looking at gory blister photos, then don't look at this photo coming up. It's not pretty. I'm showing you this to highlight the ramifications of trying to get hydrocolloids to do something they're just not designed to do. Okay, here it is. It just doesn't work. So please don't ever use Compede as a prevention strategy. It'll almost always end in tears. Mistake number two is to put Compede on the wrong kind of blister. Compede is not going to help a blister with a roof. In fact, it'll make it worse. Why? Because it's going to stick like glue to your blister roof. And as you take that blister dressing off, you're going to rip the blister roof off with it. Now, I'm not going to subject you to a photo of this, but you can imagine why this is bad news. It's bad news because it's going to hurt. And it's bad news because you need that skin to stay there to protect your raw blister base. So what type of blister is Compete good for? The answer is de-roofed blisters. You know those blisters where the roof has been rubbed right off, leaving nothing but a red raw sore? That's the base of your blister. Hydrocolloid dressings have been made for exactly this purpose, to help heal these red, raw, slightly weepy sores from the bottom up. Here's how it works. The weepiness stops the compede from sticking to the saw. And what's more, the weepiness combines with the dressing to form a gel-like substance that helps the skin heal quicker. So much quicker than if you just let the air get to it and scab over. So the moral of the story is, never put compede on a blister roof. Mistake number three is to take your blister dressing off too early. Hydrocolloids are designed to stay on for days at a time, like two, three, or even five days at a time. Now, if your blister is extremely weepy, a hydrocolloid is not your best option. But for light to moderately weepy de-roof blisters, hydrocolloids should be left on for days at a time. This will give the wound the environment it needs to help skin to grow back quicker and to be more stretchy and resilient. And this is exactly what you want, strong and stretchy skin. And now for a quick bonus tip. Compete is really sticky, but it's common for an edge to roll back and stick to your sock. The Compete and your sock, they bunch up and that lump can actually cause a blister. So my advice is to always anchor the edges of your hydrocolloid dressings with Fixamol or some other tape that you trust to stop that rollback. So there you have it. Number one, don't ever use Compede in the hope it will prevent blisters because it won't and you'll pay the price. Number two, 
Don't ever put Compete on a blister whose roof is still there. Only ever use it on a de-roof blister. Number three, leave your dressing on for days to help healing. And my bonus tip, anchor the edges down with a tape to stop rollback. So there you have it. If you'd like to know more about the So that's pretty good information to know and good information to pass on to your clients. Now I'm not going to get into blister treatment much more on this occasion other than to mention two things. I don't know if you've noticed this but blister treatment is blister prevention plus looking after the skin lesion. Think about it. If you want to have a real impact on your blister or your client's blister, you have to reduce the pressure, reduce the friction level, absorb some shear or do something to minimize that excessive skin shear. That way it will feel less painful straight away and it will heal faster. Otherwise the ongoing skin shear is disrupting whatever healing is happening. And I had one mum tell me she applied the right blister treatment to her daughter's blister based on all the things we talked about. And she played every game of a two day netball carnival, had no blister pain and the blister was in better shape after the carnival than it was before. Eliminating skin shear during blister treatment is paramount if you want a good outcome. Matt Angus is another example of the kind of impact the right blister treatment can make. He's happy for me to share his story about how he'd thrown in the towel at his race, a 48 hour ultra marathon, um, but someone convinced him to come and see me before he made it official and we lanced his blister, popped an island dressing on it, a donut, pat, donut pad and an engo patch on his insole and he finished the last three and a half hours, put another 34 k's on the board and he had no blister pain. The best blister treatment equals blister prevention plus looking after the skin lesion. There's no reason why you can't help your clients get this kind of freedom from the pain and worry and interruption of foot blisters in their active lifestyles. Even if they're blister prone, even if they're competing in really challenging environmental conditions, even if they've got significant functional or structural foot issues, even if they're an elite athlete, and even if they're just starting out with their fitness goals. Foot blisters are common. In fact, they're the most common injury in sport. And if you're not seeing many people complaining of blisters, that's because they're not bothering to tell you. Because every piece of advice they've ever received in the past has provided underwhelming results and everything else they've tried hasn't worked. Ask them. People are putting up with them. Their blisters are a complete mystery to them. So offer your help, especially to your athletes, especially netball and tennis and the longer distance running and the hikers. You'll be surprised with what comes out of the woodwork, even with your regular clients too. Now, you've joined this webinar this evening to find out how you can help your clients with their blisters. And I'm sure there's something here that you can use as of tomorrow that will help you get better outcomes. Whether it's that subtle mindset shift to thinking in terms of shear, whether it's a new prevention strategy you'd not considered before, or whether it's a better handle on how your favorite prevention strategy works. I hope this webinar has been worthwhile attending. But there are more ways I can help. And that's with something called Build Your Blister Plan. Build Your Blister Plan is an online course based on everything we've just talked about. It gives you everything you need to know to manage foot blisters from go to woe. And it consists of the How Prevention Strategies Work module, the Blisters by Anatomical Location modules, and the Cutting Edge Blister Treatment module. And anyone can take the Build Your Blister Plan program. You don't have to be a podiatrist. In fact, I've built this first and foremost for your clients, the kinds of people getting on Google and searching for ways to solve their blister problems. It's written for your average Joe Blow so they can quickly grasp the concepts and skills and run with it. I'm pretty confident in saying this is the most valuable information you'll find written on the topic of foot blisters, in my humble opinion, of course. So let me show you the three Build Your Blister Plan packages. First, there's Weekend Warrior, and this is for people who are getting blisters more often than they'd like and need the kind of insights we've just talked about to find real solutions for their blisters. It's simply the course content I've just explained, plus there's a bonus module, and anyone and everyone taking the program gets access to me in the discussions forum to ask any questions about their blisters or difficulties they're having or whatever they like. 
I want people to come out of this thing with their minds blown and their feet blister free and I'm prepared to do anything I can to help. So providing that kind of support is very important to me. Secondly, Event Racer is everything in Weekend Warrior plus the extras pack and that's a pack containing my Ultra Blister Kit, my book and shipping worldwide. This is my favourite option and it used to be the only way I provided this training. I like it because you're getting a head start by having some excellent gear in the form of the Ultra Blister Kit delivered to your door. It's especially good for people who are training for a big event, they're pushing the boundaries and realise blisters are a likely consequence, or they're heading somewhere where there's a lack of decent medical facilities. It's also a great option if you're blister prone and need some top of the range gear for your day to day activities. And lastly, Medic. Medic is everything in Weekend Warrior plus the Medics module and professional support. It's for people who provide foot care or medical services in their clinics or at athletic events. So that's you. It's an all-in-one blister management education package so you can see how to educate your clients. It helps you develop your skills in prevention and treatment from a health professional's point of view. And plus you get my direct email for private professional support whenever you need it. As I mentioned earlier, my aim is to help you get great outcomes with blisters for your clients. So they're the three Build Your Blister Plan packages. And here's what I want you to consider. If you want to become as helpful as you can be to your clients with foot blisters, the obvious next step is to take Build Your Blister Plan Medic. I'd be delighted to have you there and to work with you. And just to help you get over the line with this, I'm giving you an opportunity to get this package at 50% off. More on that in a moment, I've got a discount code that you'll need to jot down if you want to take advantage of that. But the other thing I want you to consider is, if for whatever reason you're not in a position to go into blister management more yourself at this time, it doesn't mean you can't help your clients. You know there's a resource that you can point them in the direction of and be confident they'll be getting the best possible advice and guidance there is with me to help them every step of the way. So let me show you around the course modules. Let's say your client chooses the Weekend Warrior package. When you're on the inside, these are all the modules. You can go through them in any order that you like. You simply click on the module and see what's inside. Let's have a look at what's in the How Prevention Strategies Work module. Here's the taping lesson with a few videos. And look, you can see which lessons you've done and which ones you've got to go. Then let's say we've done that and we want to have a look at toe blisters and in particular interdigital blisters to find out which prevention strategies are best for this type of blister. So that's how you navigate around the course. Make sense? So I just wanted you to know that if you do point someone in my direction, this is what things will look like inside the course and this is what it will look like for you too, but you'll have an extra module, the medics module. Now this webinar special is 50% off the Medics package and it expires in 72 hours. You'll need this discount coupon code to take advantage of the discount so just dot, jot that down now. But if this offer is not right for you right now that's absolutely no problem. This program isn't going anywhere. You can jump on board anytime it suits you. Look I love helping people with blisters and it's so easy to make a massive difference and people really appreciate it. Knowing this stuff has not only helped me sort out my own blister prone feet, it's made me better at my job and I want the same for you. So if you decide to take me up on this medic webinar special, you'll be directed to this page to complete your purchase. This is what it will look like. Pop in the discount code here and you can pay by a credit card or PayPal. You fill in your details and then you'll get an email with your login and you're free to start learning. But whatever you decide to do from here, if you have any questions at all about blisters, please don't hesitate to contact me at support at blisterprevention.com.au. Thank you for turning up tonight and spending an hour with me rabbiting on about blisters with my croaky voice. And really, I congratulate you on um, being so interested in what is the most common injury in sport and something where we have the potential to be much better at helping our clients with. So it's over and out from me for now. Thanks again for being here and I look forward to helping you inside the Build Your Blister Plan program in the very near future. But now let's get into some Q&A.